Welcome everyone for this session of the Economy of Francesco School, organized by our village, that is the village CO2 of inequality. It is a pleasure for us to be here with you representing our village and we are so excited about our special and amazing guests. I am Serena Ionta, I'm a PhD candidate at Roma Tre University and I've just completed a visiting uh, in Lisbon. I work in applied macroeconomics and I've been part of this village since the beginning of the economy of Francesco. And with me, there is also Luciano, please. Hi everyone, thank you, Serena. Uh, hi, my name is Luciano. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, and I'm an economist for the production strategy at the Ministry of Economic and Development in in Argentina, in the city of Buenos Aires. So hi everyone, welcome. Let me say a few words about our village. We are researchers, policymakers, and uh, entrepreneurs from all over the world. We spend our energy on discussion, on training meetings, and there was also no shortage for more practical initiative we will talk about uh, later. We think that to build an economy that is regenerative and inclusive by design, and that no larger products, even a single victim, we must first understand the sorts and the causes of inequality. So uh, we truly believe the interrelationship between pollution and inequality. There is no equality without a real protection of our common home, and just as there is no real protection of the common home without an idea of, e of equality among the people who inhabit it. As Pope Francis shared with us in Assisi last September, carbon dioxide is not the only uh, pollution that kills, but also inequality fatally damages our planet. So our village commitment is capturing in the final statement as a commitment to reduce inequality, by becoming a living uh, covenant with the most vulnerable in our communities. So this session aims to do just this, uh, starting with the idea of dignity and uh, integral uh, human development. Um, the US school... Oops. So... Uh, maybe there is I can hop on and, and cover for Luciano uh, just while he gets his connection uh, back on. Hello, my name is Tony. I'm a member of the village. Um, today's EOF school is an opportunity to embark on a journey toward a more holistic view of the problem of inequality. Um, you know, the theme of this year's EOF school is capitals beyond capitals. And really inequality is, is a social challenge that transcends financial capital and capitalism. Um, and so it's important that we focus not just on inequality, but on inequalities that threaten human dignity and integral human development. And that's for all people, right? Everyone. Um, inequality, it's not just an economic issue. Uh, and economic inequalities directly affect every other area of our human dignity. We want to challenge the idea that inequality is just economic. In order to better understand this topic, um, we have some fabulous speakers. Uh, and so we're going to discuss the relationship between dignity and inequality and explore the concept of integral human development as an approach to building a more equitable world. Um, and we're also going to hear about how new indicators can catalyze uh, this transformation. So um, one other note, there will be a 
question and answer period at the end of the session. So make sure you mark down any questions you have and we'll, we'll have all of our speakers together for you to ask at the end of the session. Uh, with that, it's my honor to introduce Nian Ha Shep. He is the Kim B. Clark Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School, and he co-leads the Justice, Health, and Democracy Impact Initiative, an applied research program that partners with elected leaders in their communities to explore how ethics and normative principles can lead to more just and human dignity-oriented public policies. Nian Ha, it is a pleasure to have you join us at this month's Economy of Francesco School. Uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you very much for that introduction. And, and Serena and uh, Luciano, thank you very much for the invitation um, to participate today. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here and join you as part of your work um, of the economy of Francesco's school. So what I thought I would do before I go into talking a little bit about how one might think about the relationship of inequality, equity, and then dignity, is just to preface my remarks by saying that um, my approach uh, to these issues, uh, just to be clear, is largely informed by what you might call sort of an Anglo-American, European, liberal, egalitarian, philosophical tradition. So if you think about people like Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and Kant, uh, and more contemporary scholars would include, say, someone like John Rawls, or Martia Sen, that's the approach uh, that I've taken to thinking about these issues, just to help clarify where I'm coming from, and so I very much hope that today's uh, session will also be an opportunity for me to learn how to think about these issues from the perspective of the economy of Francesco. So what I thought I would do first is say a little bit about um, Tony's remarks about why we want to move from thinking about inequality to dignity by way of the concept of equity. Then what I want to say a little bit about is why we shouldn't be so quick to uh, jettison the idea of equality as an ideal and that there's certain ways in which people have tried to um, address the criticisms that might be raised against focusing on equality. And then finally, I wanna talk a little bit about um, dignity and I think some of the challenges uh, that are also there in thinking about using dignity as a way to capture what it is that we care about in the context of thinking about economic policies and activity in a way that is relevant for practitioners here today. So I think the first move that people make, right, in moving from inequality to equity is that inequality often is sort of outcome oriented, right? It's often focused on resources, material measurements, such as income and wealth. And it doesn't capture the fact that there's some inequalities that may not be relevant. And similarly, does not capture the fact that even if we do achieve certain equalities, say an outcome, that may not actually reflect the underlying unfairness or injustice that gave rise to these problems in the first place. So that I think is the reason that a lot of people have moved to try to thinking in terms of equality to equity, because equity captures ideas of fairness, justice, that it matters not just that people have equal outcomes, Right, or start from the same place, but there are certain kind of inequalities or underlying unfairnesses right, that might affect their ability or capacity to achieve certain outcomes. So that's, I think, the intuition for why people have moved uh, to equity rather than inequality. I think the other thing that equity captures, uh, which inequality may not capture so much, is that inequality is, again, a kind of a pattern that we focus on. Whereas equity, I think, tries to capture more the idea of how we treat one another and what goes into those resulting outcomes. So that's another reason I think that people have focused a lot on equity in this discussion. And the third one, I think, is that um, it, it, it does try to get at this idea that we're not simply focusing on um, uh, the actual material conditions, but also on sort of the underlying human basis or foundation about what we care about. So equity is about people in some sense, whereas inequality, right, perhaps maybe it seems more about in the realm of the material. So that all having been said, I just wanna highlight a few uh, moves that people have made in the philosophical tradition to try to address those, those criticisms. I think if you were to talk to, for example, in the philosophical world, uh, people are still very much um, keen to focus on equality as opposed to equity. 
And there are few few reasons for, for how the idea of equality might be able to address the kind of criticisms that have raised to sort of push us towards equity. And one is the whole equality of what debate. So in other words, if we can just specify more precisely what it is that should be equal, then some people have argued that that actually can help address the criticism with regard to the need to move to equity. Right? So for example, if we think about equality of opportunity, right? or if we think about equality of um, certain basic kind of resources that everybody would need to be able to achieve a good life, as opposed to say, simply focusing on outcomes. That's one way people have said that we can both address the kind of concerns about the simply outcome oriented nature of inequality. The fact that we focus um, also on the underlying unfairness and inequality, right? And then simultaneously get to the idea of being able to treat people in a way, right? That reflects a way to respect the right kind of equality. So just wanna put that out there, right? So that for those of you who are sympathetic to thinking in terms of the idea of equality, um, that one way to address the kinds of criticisms that people have raised is to focus on the equality of what discussion and really clarify exactly what it is that we care about that should be equal in that respect. I also wanna focus on one important idea of equality that relates to dignity, which is that at the fundamental level, right, equality is a very powerful ideal. Right? And the idea of dignity can't do justice to what we think about unless we take seriously the idea of equality in dignity, right? because dignity ultimately is about status. And it's about the idea that people have equal high status. And so in that sense, right, we can't get away from the idea of equality. To close, I think the challenge in focusing on dignity is that there is a component of the concept of dignity that is inherently about one's own sense of self. Right? It's not just how we treat others and view others, it's also how we view ourselves. And that subjective element of dignity can sometimes get in the way, right? Because it could be possible that people could be in situations that objectively we see as quite unfair, quite lacking in certain kinds of basic material needs. But we wouldn't want to say that they should somehow see themselves as having less dignity, right? Or being somehow less worthy. Because the idea that the poor can have dignity, right? That people can be in difficult situations and have dignity is a powerful idea. And so that's the one challenge I want to raise for our conversation today about why dignity, while I think it is the right concept and a powerful concept, there is this kind of self-conception and self-perception part of dignity that we also have to be very careful about and being sure that we don't attribute to people either a lack of dignity, right? Or perhaps in some sense, an inflated sense of dignity um, when that is inappropriate. So I hope that is a helpful foundation on which to begin our discussion today. And thank you very much. And I forward, look forward to our uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Ninha. Uh, now we know better uh, what we have to do. We have to, uh, we have to describe and to, and to know better what is really inequality. And also if we uh, prioritize dignity as a guiding principle, we can more clarify this. So it's, it's very important. But you will be back uh, with us later for another uh, discussion. Now I have the, the pleasure to introduce Kelly Regan Heike. She's the director of formation at the Francesco Collaborative, where she helps financial uh, decision makers deepen their moral imagination to align their investment and uh, action with a regenerative and integral vision of the economy. She is also co-author of the book, Counting the Cost, Financial Decision Making, Discipline and uh, Christian Living. Kelly, it is a real pleasure to have you join us today. And I ask you some question. First one is, uh, please tell us what is this integral human development 
and how is integral human uh, development different from economic development in in, uh, in a normal uh, way and uh, the, the normal thing that we know uh, and we study in our university so please Kali the, the floor is yours Thank you so much, Serena. And Luciano, thank you for having me. It is such a delight to be in this space. The Economy of Francesco School is just always such a moving and special place to be. So I'm so grateful for the invitation um, to share more. So this first question is a really big one. What is integral human development? Um, and I think a favorite definition for this, for me, comes from ethicist Lori Kelleher. And she defines it as a human-centered development perspective that originates from Catholic social teaching and the perspective holds that authentic development is development that makes every person more human. So for me, integral human development is really at its core about flourishing. It's about providing the kinds of conditions that enable us to live a life that's worthy of our humanity, one of beauty and creativity and relationship and self-gift. And I think it's also really an approach that honors the human person as a whole person, so mind, body, and spirit. And I think it's also very important to note that integral human development or IHD, as we sometimes say, is not separable from the common good or from community. It's a kind of affront to individualism and recognizes that our flourishing as human persons unfolds and is only possible in community and in relationship with one another. And I really love this question, how is integral human development different than the economic development that we learn about in school? Um, and that's normally done. And I think it's different in about a million ways. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to answer this question. I think my first approach is just thinking about um, means versus ends. And the dominant approach to economic development, um, the or the dominant approach of economic development that we study so often um, in our universities, I think, defines the end of development as a profitable economy. It sees people as means to achieving metrics of economic success and seeks to make people not necessarily the ends of the economy, but make people the means for the economy and the economy as an end. And um, I think too, it also really seeks to make individuals producers and consumers in a system um, without regard for their, their larger sense of humanity. And integral human development, I think on the other hand, rightfully sees the economy as a means for human flourishing. It sees the proper end of the economy as the flourishing human being and not the other way around. I think too, integral human development puts ultimate questions. So questions about meaning and truth and goodness and priority of place. And it really asks where we're going and why we're going there. And normal economic development, I think, doesn't ask ultimate questions. Um, it has defined its purpose as growth and profitability and consumption and unlimited choice as its ends. And I think it's kind of the technocratic paradigm that Pope Francis mentioned so often in Laudato Si. It's really an acceptance of every advance in technology, regardless of its impact on human life and what it means for human life and society and culture. I think too, participation is a key theme that distinguishes integral human development from many forms of economic development. So Pope Francis tells us again and again that those on the peripheries of the society should be at the center of the conversation when it comes to discerning solutions that better enable human flourishing. And dominant approaches to economic development, I think, are often more about scale. It's about a top-down administration of a solution that can work everywhere. So in essence, it's about bigness. And IHD recognizes that global communities are diverse and that what works somewhere will not work everywhere. And one of my um, very favorite US writers, Wendell Berry, often writes about the beauty of smallness. And I think integral human development really is about operating at a small scale and it gives control and power to particular people who are committed to a particular place. Um, and I think one final note about integral human development for me too is that I think so much of our economic system and our economic development is focused on wealth accumulation as kind of the ultimate goal. Um, and there's a sense too, when we're thinking about inequality that um, there can be an affront to integral human development, both in poverty and with wealth. Um, so we hear again and again that wealth um, is the root of all evil in the gospel. Um, so just recognizing that at both ends of the economic spectrum, there's a risk, I think, to our inherent development as human beings. Thank you, Kelly. 
Um, as you know, uh, we as Economy of Francesco are very practical also. So we want to know in the real life, uh, what are the implications of uh, what you say before? And uh, especially if we think about our culture and our anthropological system. Yes, such a good question. I love this question of practice. Um, I think we can and that IHD can really be embodied in many different ways. Um, so thinking about my work with the Francesco Collaborative, we work mostly with investors and financial decision makers that are interested in cap um, in transferring their capital to more kind of values aligned prophetic visions of a flourishing economy. Um, so one example I think comes, um, it's a programmatic example in that um, as people with capital investors, they can fund opportunities and programs that can improve the material well-being of others. Um, so one example, there's an NGO in Ireland that funds clean cook stoves. Um, and that's an example in Eritrea and Ethiopia. So for women there, it gives them safety. They don't have to go out and collect firewood. It also improves air quality. Um, it's safer for their children. They have more leisure time. Um, so that's, I think, one example of what does it mean to just improve basic material standards. I think another example is also structural. Um, so in our work, we also are pretty deeply embedded in the cooperative ecosystem. So what does it mean to give workers participation um, in decision making and in sharing um, the profits of their labor? So I think that's another example of how are we setting up and structuring our organizations? And we can do that with an IHD lens. Um, and I think one other example is also our own mindset and our own kind of perspective. Um, and we can begin to really embody integral human development in our own lives when we begin to shift our own paradigms. Um, what does it mean to embody kind of a posture of what we say is non-maximization of kind of a letting go and not needing to seek for investors, for example, unlimited financial return and growth? What does it mean to dare to define our own success, whether that's professional or personal or economic, outside of the contemporary marketplace, which seems to equate a successful life with wealth accumulation? Um, so how can we just begin to see ourselves um, outside of the marketplace? I think it's very tempting, um, especially in my context, in the Western context, to embed ourselves um, and define our own success by the success of the market. Um, there's a cartoonist named Ken Hubbard that um, has this beautiful quote that I adore that he says that the hardest thing in the world is to take less when you can get more. And I think it's that how do we have a posture of taking less in the world? Um, so how can we begin to embody that ourselves? Um, so that was your first question. Serena, remind me of your second. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you for your answer. Um, now I can re-welcome uh, Nian Ha. Now we can have a um, comparison together if it's possible. And I would like to know how do each of you see um, uh, the concept of integral human development, Kelly, share fitting into the vision of dignity. If these two things can, uh, how can I say, speak each other, and we want to do this link together if it's possible. And another thing that I want to know is that uh, what are the biggest barriers to the to institution, either governments or private institution, centering uh, the, the work of of uh, dignity and uh, what we said before about uh, this relationship and if you want to 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 say something together and to and to ask something uh, each other it's a pleasure for us to to hear you and your precious uh, uh, speech thank you and um, please um, Nian Hai, if you want uh, the floor is your uh thank you no i this is uh this is um a great set of questions. Um, I think uh, based on my understanding of integral human development, uh, we could very much understand it as grounded in the recognition of dignity of individuals, right? So the idea of the inherent worth, the importance of, of thinking about uh, human flourishing. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's exactly, I think, very um, uh, sympathetic, sympathetic and, and sort of compatible in that way. I think the one thing that I do would be interested to learn more about 
which is at least for me why dignity is a powerful concept, is that dignity is also inherently relational. In other words, it's how we stand in relationship to one another. It's about our status right, in a society or in an economy or in a community in relationship to one another. And I think for me, that's a very important idea that is captured by the concept of dignity. Um, and it'd be interesting to see where that comes into play in the context of integral human development. Um, I suppose maybe it comes in your idea of thinking about relationships or membership in a community, but there's something about that idea, I think, that um, is important to, to at least highlight in the idea of, of, of dignity. And so that's sort of one thing there. And then the other thing I'll just throw out there as well is that because of that, in a capitalist economy, my own view uh, is that um, it's impossible to have equal high status or dignity without widespread ownership of capital. So I sort of leave it at that and, and, and we'll be interested to sort of um, explore that further with you all. Please, Kelly, if you want to add something. Yes. Oh, I think that's such an interesting question to Nianha. Thank you for raising that. Um, I think the way to that, I think coming from a very Catholic and um, Christian perspective, thinking of dignity as inherent, as something that just exists and is and can't be taken away, can't be added to. Um, but I do, yes, I think that there's some wrestling that we need to do in kind of accepting dignity as a theological concept. But then what does it mean to live in a world with such severe inequality and that we do see, we I think we experience our dignity um, in relationship with one another and how we see our, our status and place in the world. Um, so I'm just, I'm grateful for that nuance um, and bringing that kind of tension to light. Um, I was also deeply moved in Yanaha by, by what you had said about the, um, the key question is really the equality of what um, and how that there are so many kind of ultimate questions that are embedded within that question of what should be equal. Um, what is it that we are going towards? Um, what is kind of the ultimate end? Um, so I think that that's something that we can sit with more when we think about integral human development and we think about forming an economy that supports um, and, and enables us um, to achieve um, integral human development is what is it that is worth wanting? What does it mean to be a flourishing human being? Being that's fully alive in the world. Um, so I think holding those kind of ultimate, very um, deep moral questions um, at the center of our conversations will be very important. Thank you uh, both. As um, uh, we 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 really think uh, that uh, this is very important to link these two things, and we really um, believe on this because uh, we wanted to. To share uh, all the all the possibility to uh, you know to answer what is it what is inequality. So it's important for us to have you here. And now uh, we can um, uh, we can continue with Luciano. We have Luciano now with us. Yeah, yeah. I I want to say that I loved everything that I hear since we start. It's incredible to to have with us. Uh, I believe that uh, focusing on dignity is, is at the core of our village and the whole economy of Francis. That's the point and our goal. Um, and I think it, it is fundamental what Kelly pointed out. Uh, we must focus on economic being uh, means, uh, the the, sorry, the economy being means uh, to the human being and not the human being a mean for the economy. That's uh, uh, that's fundamental for us. We will have Kelly and Nyeha in the Q and A section later. So to continue, um, I want to share with you that uh, one of our values in our village is that everyone should have a seat at the table, uh, and that means making sure that we are not just. Uh, talking about those who face inequality, but that they are part of the conversation and that their participation should lead leads our work. And as a part of that commitment, uh, we will hear uh, from one of our villages 
uh, and her partners doing a fabulous uh, work in Burkina Faso. So let's start with the video. Do, do we have the the video? Slight technical misclicking on my. Okay, no problem. problem. Madame Soudre Nissa Odogo Natasha, membre de la coordination eh, du village COD et inégalité. Je suis eh, président de l'association Apostolat des pauvres, sise au Burkina Faso, précisément à Bobo Dioulasso. Cette association a pour but d'accompagner les enfants de la rue, les enfants abandonnés et les enfants vulnérables dans l'optique de les réinsérer dans notre société. Et vu le contexte actuel sur le terrorisme, nous voudrions offrir un avenir meilleur pour ces enfants. Je suis Madame Zango Marie-Denise. Je suis chargée de, de, du renforcement, de, du renforcement des capacités de, de formation au niveau de l'association. Et vu euh, l'état actuel de notre pays, nous sommes à la recherche des fonds pour construire une école de formation sociale et une école pour les enfants de la rue. Merci. Bonsoir, je vous Moi, je suis Victor Erosine, membre de l'association. Je vais vous brosser un peu les activités que nous avons pu mener depuis 2020. Merci. Nous avons pu soutenir la scolarisation de deux enfants de deux années consécutives. Nous avons pu travailler à voir le résultat de l'association. Également, nous nous retrouvons chaque mois pour des rencontres pour des réunions dans le sens de voir ensemble comment aller de l'avant. Nous avons organisé trois formation, de trois formations pour euh, en faveur des membres et deux sur les trois ont été déjà réalisées. Voilà, ce sont des formations sur la vie associative pour embrayer tout le monde parce qu'on n'est pas forcément euh, au courant de, de la vie associative. Et dernièrement, nous sommes en train de nous organiser pour une Noël des enfants, une fête avec les enfants. Et voilà, nous sommes en train de prendre des contacts pour que cela se concrétise d'ici la fin de l'année. Voilà ce que nous, je peux dire sur ce que nous avons déjà fait. Et on continue par la fin de ce We thank Natasha for her participation and all his all her community. It is a pleasure to have a testimony from Africa, the continent with the with the greatest inequalities in our world. Um, we must all continue to work for Africa, as Pope Francis uh, just indicated in the event last September. Um, the next. Uh, in the next video, we, we are uh, very excited uh, of Sherry, uh, sorry. We are excited uh, to share with you this project in which uh, our village, uh, our villagers were working uh, to explore in first person approaches to a more comprehensive, comprehensive vision of inequality and dignity. Um, so please, uh, Tony, share with us the next video.
We live in a world of different colors, ethnicities, and beliefs. What we do have in common, though, is our humanity and vulnerability. We all have feelings, hopes, and dreams. In this world of conflict and strife, we need to take care of each other. ¿Te sientes parte de la sociedad? Sí. ¿Por qué? Porque yo ayudo, leo, estudio, hago mis, hago mis tareas, me voy a mis clases, me voy al jardín, como y voy, me voy al recreo y vuelta vengo y ahí hago mis tareas. ¿Cómo crees que podemos involucrar a todos? en la sociedad. Ven los amigos, dormimos. Ya. Familia, sí, ser, ser cumpleaños. We are in the community, but uh, we need to change our, how to say, understanding for other people because everybody is different. When uh, I found a group of people that understand me, they're called Sasib and uh, I was then a part of the community because of them, because they understand my needs. <laughs> That was like message to other people that we are all this, uh, that we are the same and we could uh, we could go and do things together as we are stay uh, as we are to, as, as we are together we can do a lot of things. Mm, soy de la provincia del Carchi, parroquia. Eh, Cantón Mira, Parroquia La Concepción, pero toda mi vida he residido aquí en la ciudad capital. En las actividades que estoy involucrado en, este, en estos instantes, yo tengo que estar, eh, todo ser humano es parte de la sociedad y por ende estamos involucrados en la sociedad, eh, por el, lo tanto tenemos en las escuelas, colegios, universidades, trabajo, somos parte de una sociedad, entonces no podemos decir que estamos fuera de ella si somos parte productiva del país. Entonces, eh, por tal razón, no, casi no hay individuos, no hay personas que sean eh, gente que están fuera de la sociedad, que de pronto tengamos eh, distintos conceptos de ello es otra cosa. Should it be the case where someone is not part of the world and its society? Rather, we have a duty to include our neighbors, because they are our brothers and sisters. God is our Father, and nobody is outside of His love. I hope you are fine. My name is Ana Argento Nasser. I am from Cordoba, Argentina, and I am part of this beautiful family of Economia Francesco and part of the village CO2 of Inequalities. I am here to present our project, the project that is called the Active Voice of Diversities. That this project is a series of videos that we have been may, making with uh, different people from different villages and especially also with the help of the Latin American Network of Economia Francesco and the Commission of the Peripheries. And well, we have already two, um, two trailers that you can watch on the YouTube channel of the Economia Francesco. And what is the objective of this project? The main goal is to open space for people who are living in the peripheries and that their voices 
are here for all over the world. So what we have made is um, create a, a script in where we show um, this the idea of that all people live in the world together uh, and we need to acknowledge each each other okay and we ask the people the three same questions for everyone they um, answer these questions and then we with addition <laughs> make the um, the mixture between the answer for example from people with disabilities migrants native people children etc um, well, and the background of this is the, the model of communication and legitimate acknowledgement of the disability that I, I work on, on in with my team of Body World Mass Foundation. For that, um, we have the help of the foundation and also the help of Stratia Production, that is a social enterprise that help us with the addition of the videos. The idea of this um, this video is also to to ask you for help to join us to this project. We need a lot of hands to continue making the, the videos. The idea is to make chapters, different chapter with different um, issues, problems, and people talking. So well, maybe if we have more hands in 2024 we can reach our goal. So, well, if you want to help, please write uh, to the email of our village, co2inequalities at gmail. Well, thank you and big hug for all of you. It is a pleasure to have Anna in our team. Uh, she, well, she, she's great. <laughs> despite, uh, I want to say that uh, despite uh, the difficulties and challenges we face, uh, I'm happy to know that in our communities, countless people are counting with us. Uh, this event will help us to get more people involved in addressing the inequalities present in our communities. So Serena, please continue. Here we are. So um, now uh, we can speak about uh, you know uh, inequality in a in a first person. So um, we have maybe some video. Uh, Tony, can you confirm this? No video, just right over to my mouth. Okay, so we can uh, go with another um with another sharing um basically uh what we want to know uh from uh, nian ha and kali is to yeah uh, to moderate the the live chat if there are some uh, some question if the if the people ask something we have some uh, some question from the chat of youtube Tony, can you yeah. help me? And, but, yeah, and so we have we have one last detail before, while folks submit those questions. Um, one last thing that we wanted to highlight and that really um, excites our village and that we think is, is a key part of this new approach, this alternative approach uh, to inequality. And that's really thinking about measurement and how measurement can really catalyze change within the economy of Francesco movement. Um, and to really anchor that excitement for us and, and for our village, I want to start with a story. The story takes place in 1947 in the city of Geneva. In that year, uh, the economist Ludwig von Mises traveled to Geneva to visit the economist Willem Roepke. And during the visit, they walked about seeing all the sites in the city and ended up walking out the city gate. And there before them, kind of across the horizon, were the people of the town producing produce and growing vegetables in, in small plots just outside the city wall. During World War II, when there was great famine and, and many people were struggling in Europe, the city had given this land to the community and so that they could grow their own food and so they would suffer less. But it became so popular that even when the war ended, the people continued to grow food there. And so von Mises, as he surveyed and, and looked at, at this land, he said, oh, what an inefficient way of producing food. 
And Roki listened and nodded. Perhaps that may be true, he said. But perhaps it is an extremely efficient way of producing human happiness. And we think that this, this dichotomy, right, between what you measure being what is viewed as success is really important. Because within the economy of Francesco movement and within our vision of the economy and of social progress, our end is very different than the prevailing end of the economy as, as has been discussed previously in this conversation. The existing measures we have to measure the economy reinforce a merely financial conception of the economy. Instead, we view that the economy, not as something external that we transact with, but instead the economy is the myriad shared ways that we create, care for those we love, and use capital, not just financial capital, but all forms of capital to become individually and collectively whole. And so measurement is an important way that we can help shift the structures of our government, the economy, and communities toward integral human development, toward dignity, and really as a tool to address inequality. I'm reminded of an example that friend of the economy of Francesco, Vandana Shiva, uses often. Early in her work organizing farmers, um, they would often come against corporations. Uh, and the corporations, their key performance indicator was yield per acre. How much stuff could you grow measured by weight, by quantity? But when in their organizing, they, they kind of transition, instead of trying to talk about yield per acre, they talked about nutrition per acre. And it all of a sudden changed the frame, right? Because growing a monoculture with lots of chemicals, that wasn't the way to bring about dignity. It wasn't a way to bring about integral humanness in that community, but instead growing native plants, right? In a, in a diverse way that focused on the nutrients that humans needed. Um, and so we think measurement is really important for achieving our goals, right? When you set the goal with your measure against it, it's a lot easier to perform and meet that goal. But beyond just using measures as a way to track performance and accountability, we also think that measures, especially in a movement like the economy of Francesco, where there are many immersion ideas that we are trying to share, we believe that measures and indicators can be catalytic. To quote one of the handouts from today's lesson, measures can be used not to narrow the focus, but to trigger conversations, attract new change agents, encourage new partnerships, and foster joint exploration. In short, to start conversation, not settle arguments. And I think that this really captures a lot of what we're trying to do in the economy of Francesca, right? We're trying to form new partnerships, have important conversations, and explore for new partnerships that allow us to change our government, our economy, and our communities to capture this vision uh, of dignity for everyone, and, right? And really thinking about the equity um, of people's experience that dignity and a vision of integral human development. Uh, one of the things we, we love about centering integral human development in these approaches in measurement frameworks, especially for government and policymaking, is that when you use this kind of integral human development approach, participation in local leadership is at the core. No longer can, um, you know, we have for the entire world just one framework and one measure of success like we do with GDP and some of our other measures, but instead it's much more locally um, led. And I love if folks would put in the chat Examples from your own community, because we know that around the world, there are lots of places that are really doing very interesting leadership. Um, I'm going to share just three quick examples with you. Uh, so, it, but please put in your in the chat examples from your own context. The first examples I just want to highlight. Um, this is the framework that's used, uh, the Living Standards Framework from the government of New Zealand, um, and they combine a whole bunch of things in here to really capture what it would be of a measure if we're thinking about humans in capital beyond capitals, and so. They think about the aspects of not just individual well-being, but also collective quality of life. They think about the kinds of institutions and in government that are necessary to bring about that vision. And again, they think about what is wealth, not just as financial money, but all of the inputs that are necessary for human flourishing. And one of the things we also love about the program that New Zealand has done is that they've really centered the leadership of the indigenous people in their community. Another example, and this is just recently released, is the Philadelphia Social Progress Index. Philadelphia is a city in the, in the United States. Um, and they create this tool that captures the neighborhood level, different measures of social progress that are not about economics, they're not about production, they're about humans. And so you can look at the city neighborhood by neighborhood for the whole index, but also you can break down a variety of different measures to see maybe something a community is strong in one thing, but they have other 
deprivation. And so it allows policymakers to have a much more targeted approach and also allows members of those communities, those neighborhoods to better organize um, and better um, speak out and work together to ensure that everyone has this equitable access and opportunity to really live out um, their experience of dignity as a human. And my last example is one of my favorites. It's from the city of Tacoma in the United States. Um, and they have a very similar mapping tool, but something that we love about this Tacoma example is that it's not just something that the government made to put online and you know look at sometimes or for the mayor to use in speeches, but every single office in their city, all the way down to even the garbage collectors, use this as they design their public policies to ensure that the dignity of all people is integrated into every step of the policymaking process. And so um, while these are examples that I shared from government, there are many examples around the world, uh, and there's great many great opportunities for us in the economy of Francesco um, to organize with our communities, with, with our villages within the movement, but also our local hubs, um, and talk to our community about what are the indicators and the measures of success that we think capture integral human development, that we think can help us address inequality in a dignified way. Um, and then you can use that organizing right, to put pressure on the decision makers uh, of your community to really create change and really build this movement of movements that is the economy of Francesco. So uh, with that, we're gonna re-welcome Nianhan Kelly um, for the question answer period. Please do continue sharing those questions though. There are so many incredible questions that um, I wish we had an extra hour. Um, but uh, Nianhan Kelly, the first question uh, we're gonna bring is, um, how can we stop being consumers and go back to being integral humans? Can we handle the change in the job market uh, shift from progress to prosperity? And do you recommend cooperatives over for-profit business models? Nan, how do you want to start? start? I can take it. The, the first, um, I think the first question there of how can we, was it how can we move from being consumers to, Tony, remind me of the word? Integral humans. Integral humans. Um, I'm thinking even of just small steps we can take. I think so often we're focused on finding these enormous solutions to our problems. We want to all be heroes on a grand scale. Um, but even thinking of what are the small choices that we can make in our own lives. Um, and just thinking about what does it mean to grow a garden? What does that mean even if you just have a pot of soil on a windowsill? What would it mean to grow something, to become a producer, to be kind of in friendship with whatever land might be available to you? Um, so I think that like what just focusing, I think, on the smaller things that are within our control um, that we can do. And then that way we're not, even if we grow one cucumber in a summer, that is still something that we produced um, and did and consume. So how can we kind of shift and make ourselves less dependent, even if it is in very small ways? Um, so I'd say that's my, my, first, um, my first take. Yeah, I guess just to, to um, add to that is also thinking about ourselves in relation to one another. So, so in other words, um, I think consumption is a very kind of uh, individual activity at some level, right? And it's really focusing on the individual as sort of it. And I think that's important for other reasons. We don't want to deny the importance of meeting certain basic material needs. But I think is if we can, and this is where the dignity component comes in, is recognize the importance of being recognized by another person and not forget that. I think that for me is at the heart of getting away from being consumption because consumption ultimately can be solipsistic and simply about what it is that gives us pleasure and what it gives us we desire. But I think if we can sort of maintain that we can only see ourselves as truly human in the eyes of others, um, that's a way to sort of get away from this individualistic kind of consumption and thinking more in terms of how we can do things together in a certain kind of way that isn't just about production, but, but things more generally. 
I'm thinking too, one other piece that came to mind, and I I think it was John Paul II, it could have been another Pope, um, but again, again, in the, in, the, in the encyclicals, we find like this invitation to focus on being over having. Um, and I think that that's a really beautiful distinction of what does it mean to um, become more human, to live a life that's worthy of our humanity. And consumption, and especially exorbitant consumption, is not a part of that. It's not conducive. Um, We all have to consume in some ways, um, especially in the economy that we've built. But what does it mean to kind of focus on that ethic of simplicity and what it means to be a person over having? Because accumulation doesn't make us more human. Perfect. Thank you both. Another question, this one comes from Ida Marie. What is the best way to talk about dignity if it has this subjective and relational dimension, Uh, especially if you want to avoid focusing too much on outcomes in the way that talk of inequality sometimes does? Uh, And and to kind of anchor that, they, they followed up with, what is the best way to measure it without neglecting underlying unfair structures, which is such a key component? So how how would you guys address that? Uh, okay. I'll jump in. Good. Now, this is a, a great point. So, I think exactly the way to do it is to think about what are the structural barriers to dignity, and what are the ways in which there are certain patterns of behavior that reflect the lack of dignity. So in other words, I think rather than sort of focusing, I think it it sounds odd, but I think actually the way to think about it is um, where is, where do we not have dignity, right? And and, and what are the barriers to dignity as a way of thinking about um, realizing dignity? So in other words, we don't have to measure dignity itself so much as actually sort of the kinds of things that then don't come there. So what what are examples of that? Um, A lack of inclusion, Right, I think is is an example of of not having uh, a barrier to dignity. I think certain lack of access to to basic uh, needs, uh, resources, capital, ways to live one's life. Those are also barriers to dignity. So I think to answer the question, um, that might be one way to start. Uh, because certainly, if we look around us, there are um, uh, lots of barriers even before we can get to the point of thinking about um, um, achieving dignity. I don't have much to add to this. I think um, I think the, the the way that I think about it, and I think the way the Catholic tradition approaches it too, is that dignity cannot be subjective. It is always something that is inherent and something that is. Um, and that's not to say that the structural challenges that we face may be um, prevent us from living a life that is worthy of our dignity and our humanity. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I would just, I would leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. And I, I wish that we had endless time. I think both both the, the wisdom that both of you bring is, is so deep, but also the questions that this community is bringing are, are fabulous. So we're, we're continuing to collect those questions. And uh, I'm actually being told we can go a few minutes over. So one more question. I'm going to do a quick, quick scan of the questions. Uh, I'm sorry if your question is not the one we pick. Uh, what can regular citizens, the non-policymakers, do to promote integral human development? And is it possible for anyone to do something about it? Uh, and Kelly, I'll let you start on this one because uh, it's more in your wheelhouse. Yes, I am a deep believer that we all can embody integral human development in the world. Um, I think we do that by focusing on our relationships, by focusing on mutuality, um, by focusing on our own lifestyles. Um, Thinking even back to the COVID-19 crisis um, and also Pope Francis, he wrote this beautiful book, Let Us Stream in 2020. And he invites us um, to see crises as sifting and they it call us to recognize what's most important to shake up our lifestyles to shake up our priorities, to challenge ourselves to really think about ultimate questions what's most important what are my ends, Um, what do I believe in. And I think when we focus on bringing those kinds of conversations and that deep reflection into our lives, um, we become more human, Um, we are called to think deeply and reflect on the profundity of our lives and where we are 
are um, here together in this place. Um, so just thinking about how can we invite ourselves um, daily into a kind of depth that is worthy of our humanity. And we can do that through contemplation and a reflection. Um, and we can also do that in the way that we treat one another. One of my very favorite um, quotes is this idea that God loves adverbs. God cares how we do things. Um, so do we go about our lives lovingly? Do we do it um, in a way that enables other people to see their worth and to experience their own dignity? Um, so I think, yeah, just our way of being in the world is central to any kind of vision for integral human development. And I think the more that we can focus on crafting that and making that something that is beautiful, the more our society um, will begin to reflect that inner beauty. Just very quickly, I, I don't know if this is exactly specific to integral human development, but something that I focus on a lot as an instructor in a business school is to try to um, encourage my students to find a space between cynicism and hypocrisy. That in other words, we have to be realistic about the challenges that we face and not simply think that everything is going to be better, so avoid hypocrisy, but at the same time, doing so in a way that doesn't fall into what you might call cynicism or complacency. And, and I think the way to do that is to sort of to sort of maintain that kind of hope. And this perhaps is in a way that actually that sort of brings us back to the sort of the, 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 the Christian tradition, but 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 certainly I think that sense of hope and not losing that sense of hope is that sort of keeps us from falling between hypocrisy and cynicism is um I think a challenge that uh is 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 very hard uh given the way the world is but but perhaps um that may be a place to uh to start yeah I I agree with you uh, um uh, and I really want before ending our meeting I would like to to thank Kelly and Nienja again for sharing their knowledge with us. Uh, we would love to hear from, from you again soon. So personally, um, before I give the final word to Serena, I would like to point out that I'm taking a mission and a message with me. Um, the mission, I think, starts from these new metrics uh, that we have to put at the center of the research. Uh, and the message that I take with me is uh, that we have great challenges, but we must also look to the future with hope. I, I agree with Niha in this point. We have to look to the future with hope, especially for all the work we are doing at the economy of Francesco. Uh, so um, I think uh, we have to put the dignity of the people at the center of the economy uh, and in the economy science too, uh, especially also in our communities in within the very particular realities. So thank you very much. And Serena, please go ahead. Thank you everyone to being here with us. Um, please remain with us because we have the next Economy of Francesco School, the next session. Uh, it, it's a session organized by the Village Life and Lifestyle the, um, on September 25th. So uh, uh, stay with us and goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.